So who are another story? Another story is a duo consisting of Steve Malkin and myself, Henry Jackson, and we're supplemented on a few tunes by uh, electric bass, uh, three different bass players, um, a sax on one tune, and a, um, a drums, a rigged set of drums on another tune. Henry and I both uh, play in a band called Portmanteau, which I guess is a, a, a little bit more straightforward than the Another Story uh, stuff. Um, sort of funky, a bit rootsy, that sort of thing. Um, and I guess the tunes that have ended up on the Another Story album just didn't suit the band really, so uh, we just made it a separate project. Well, both Henry and I have just been writing away in our spare time, I guess, um, over many years, really. Um, and uh, the Cinematic Sea thing came together almost accidentally when um, we started comparing notes about the various tunes we were working on that weren't going to be that suitable for Portmanteau. Uh, and it turned out that there was... Uh, a surprising number of tunes that had a bit of a, uh, a sea, Pacific, ocean sort of theme in their titles. And so that was just uh, the spark, I guess, uh, where we decided that we would do something about that and, and draw those tunes together. I guess from my point of view, the collection of tunes that are represented on this particular CD are very reminiscent of um, my early days in New Zealand being exposed to Polynesian music, uh, use of uh, lap steel guitar, ukuleles, strumming guitars, and, um, and a community approach to music. So, uh, yes, the Another Story album, Cinematic Sea, is indeed a lot more varied than a, a portmanteau album. And I guess that, you know, reflects that it is really a collection of tunes that we've very slowly cobbled together over a number of years. Um, for my part, the tunes that uh, I initiated... Um, Yes, I, I have influences, I guess, but uh, when I'm writing, it's sort of just whatever comes out at the time. So uh, it might be a sound on a particular keyboard I'm playing, or it might be a beat, or you know something that's been otherwise nagging away in my mind. Um, and if uh, if it's something promising, I, I keep working on it. And um, to be honest, I, I never quite know what it's going to be or who who it's going to sound like. So. Yes, there are tunes on the album that sound a little bit Pink Floydish, and others that are a little bit ballady and everything in between. Um, and really it, it just depends on what emerges on the day. The music represented by another story is quite different from that represented by Portmanteau. Um, I think it simply represents the wide range of music that both Steve and I have played over a lengthy career in music, uh, in my case ranging from the early days of The Shadows, Ventures, Dick Dale, right through to modern day, I guess Jeff Beck, Dave Gilmore. Um, um, and for me, uh, there's a, a bit of the blues involved in there, which became, 
uh, quite a big influence on me after the early days of instrumental music such as The Shadows. It's actually a, a tune very much uh, originating from Henry and uh, uh, the, the chords and melody that you hear in the first verse there uh, that we built on. Um, and its working title was uh, Something Spanish. And so pretty much as a joke, uh, I just um, find out, found out how to say something Spanish in Spanish. And that's what Elgo Espanol is. The original inspiration for this tune, Algo Espanol, was that I was messing around on my Stratocaster and I found myself playing a motive which I found very um, redolent of um, the Ventures and Dick Dale. It just sounded like a surf sound to me. But then Steve took it into a whole different direction uh, with this sort of Moorish Arabic synthesizer uh, in the middle of the tune, plus a key change. So the, the, the sort of fluty synthesizer part uh, is just a, a sound on a very old Roland synthesizer that I have. Um, and I kind of knew that I wanted to play something that was in, in a slightly different scale, um, uh, just as a change up really, so, you know, so that it wasn't just uh, a copy of what Henry was doing on guitar. So I just messed around with some different scales and came up with that one which has a uh, I guess some uh, semitone uh, uh, intervals in it in interesting places um, and just messed around with it until it sounded right basically. As for the key change um, it's a fairly long tune and uh, I get fairly easily bored and uh, one of the things that helps uh, inject a little bit of variation into a tune is indeed a key change. Now that can be pretty corny sometimes, but I think we've pulled it off here and so it's really just a, a way of, of, of lifting and uh, adding some uh, something a bit different in the tune uh, in the run home to the end. This tune had lyrics they would be romantic ones I'll tell you that much um, but it's it hasn't so it's just a, a romantic instrumental um, and in terms of how it came together uh, I think again it's uh, that old Roland keyboard of mine had a passable viola sound on it and uh, so it started off with that sort of semi-classical viola thing at the start and uh, then I just started messing around with some chords that seemed to make sense after that. Um, uh, people who know me know that I'm a you know, big Hammond organ fan so that's why it's uh, it's got some Hammond organ in the verses and a uh, rather distorted Hammond organ solo in the middle there. So uh, yeah it, it, it was my attempt I guess to do something a uh, uh, a little bit epic and, you know, sort of uh, pseudo-classical. Um, 
that's a really old tune, as I might have mentioned elsewhere. It's uh, the original draft of it, I guess, is on a, an old Roland recording machine uh, that I've had uh, for quite a long time. Um, and I actually used all of the sounds from that old Roland synthesizer, including the drum sounds from that, uh, that synthesizer. And uh, so, um, yeah, I was just uh, scrolling through the menus on that particular machine and seeing what worked well. Hammond organ is an old Hammond X5 that I don't have anymore and that's going through a Leslie 860. Uh, of course when we came to do it for the Another Story album the uh, fake guitar that was originally in the verses has been thankfully replaced uh, by real guitar played by Henry. Yes, it's true that both of those tunes uh, have a distinctly Polynesian oceanic feel about them. And again, uh, I did draw on my New Zealand background because, as I said earlier, that was the kind of music I was exposed to at a very young age. It was all around me in Auckland because of the large Maori and Polynesian population. Uh, well, it does sound like a steel guitar, but it actually isn't. It's actually a Fender Stratocaster played with a slide. Indeed, I wish I'd actually owned a lap steel, but that's what it is. It's a Stratocaster and a slide. up to a point um, so I guess the genesis of that tune is um, the uh, the melody in the first verse was the first thing that came along um, it's actually a bass sound a, a synthesizer bass sound off my my big uh, Yamaha keyboard um, and you know it's a sound that you know was I guess recognisable as something that uh, you might have heard in a 70s prog rock tune or uh, Jean Michael Jarre or something like that. And I sort of ran with it from there and so um, uh, used that um, during the verses. And then when it came to having a, um, a couple of uh, breakout bits like bridges and middle eights and that sort of thing. The, the sort of fluty synthesizer sound uh, was certainly inspired by um, Pink Floyd and um, the organ also, uh, I, I think, I can't even name the Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd tune, but uh, uh, I, I did want a, a sort of a, a big organ sound in the, in the middle there somewhere as well.
No, it wasn't. I mean, both those people use Stratocasters and um, they use extensive use of effects. Um, I simply felt that it suited the mood of the tune and I found myself playing it without any regard to both those persons. Um, as I said, it's simply a Stratocaster with a fuzz box. It's another romantic one, I guess. Um, another one, if it had lyrics, they'd be romantic ones. Um, in terms of how it came together, um, the sound, the melody sound during the verses is yet another sound of my old Roland keyboard. Uh, rather good one, I think. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I just played around with that sound and uh, messed around with some kind of fake um, steel guitar sounds underneath um, from a, a sampler on the computer. And like most of my tunes, it just came together piece by piece and, um, you know, you finish one piece and you think, OK, what, what's going to sound good? It's a bit of a change up to add some interest uh, for the tune. But it's certainly true that I wanted the whole thing to be, you know, very, very gentle um, all the way through. And, and so it's probably the, the quietest track on the album in that sense. Yes, it is. Uh, I, I guess, as we've stated elsewhere, you know, Cinematic Sea is really a collection of tunes that Henry and I have at least started just as individuals over the years, and um, only one, certainly one that was in my computer for a few years, uh, pretty much as a finished piece. And, um, you know, I guess we thought that the parts were all uh, sort of unique and good enough to, to keep as they were without, uh, you know, making poor old Henry having to learn lines that I'd already played. So, um... In this case, all of the sounds uh, come from uh, sampler instruments within the recording program, Pro Tools in particular, a, um, a uh, sort of sampler instrument called, what's it called? Uh, Expand, that's right. Um, originally, I think it's made by, it's manufactured by Air now, used to be part, standard part of Pro Tools, um, and a, uh, a, a drum sort of program made by the same people called Strike. Um, and of course that um, Roland uh, synthesizer sound used for the, the lead melody. entry sounds so harsh um, we didn't win do we dare say that when we listened to the winning entry we didn't like it <laughs> um, so I think I'll change the words from failed entry to um, our submission to a short film music competition 
Um, but the tune already had a life of its own and already largely been composed by Henry and just um, with the inspiration of the short film, you know, we did a bit of extra arranging and added some instrumentations and the, the weird bit in the middle just to sort of fit in with the film and decided to leave the tune that way because it kind of made it even a bit more interesting. So uh, that's where we went with that one. Well, I set out intentionally to try and write a melody that was in 5-4 time. Um, as people will know, there are not many popular tunes written in 5-4. I guess there's Dave Brubeck's Take 5, Living in the Past by Jethro Tull, and the original Mission Impossible theme by Lalo Schifrin. Um, Steve actually added a lot of different um, elements to this tune. Um, and I think it's all the better for it. There, there are many interesting and different shifts in the tune, I think. Uh, there's backwards guitar, there's um, music concrete, and at the very end a swinging 1960s London groove, sort of like Austin Powers meets Georgie Fane. tune haunted uh, it's very true that the first half of the tune um, is reminiscent of the early 60s when indeed instrumentals did rule the western world uh, thinking of the shadows of ventures dick dale and life prior to the beatles but then there are later sections that sound a bit like santos and johnny with their amazing sleepwalk even jeff beck and Albatross by Fleetwood Mac, who of course wrote this in response to Santos and Johnny's sleepwalk. But then again, Steve took it into a whole different realm as the tune builds up to the end. So I actually had to go back and look at the Pro Tools session uh, for this one to try to remember what I actually uh, used to play in those um, string section parts. Um, they're audio files, so that leads me to guess that I've used my two hardware synths, the, the Roland and the Yamaha, and some of the orchestral sounds on those uh, to build up those sections. Um, it was just one of those things where I, I thought it was a great tune as it was um, and, and in a way the, the, uh, the string section bit at the end kind of stands alone and, and it's almost uh, a piece in its own right. Um, in fact I may have come up with it separately to Haunted and then just had a, a bit of a flash that it would make a a rather quirky thing to put on the end of that very moody tune. Um, in a way it shouldn't work because it's in a different key. It's not particularly related to the tune musically in that sense. Um, and yet it's, it's almost like a, 
I don't know, a, another act in an opera or a, a ballet score or something, uh, that the two seem to, to go well together and uh, Henry seemed to agree, so uh, we left it in there. Well, this is uh, another really old one. Um, this must go back, you know, 12 or 13 years originally. Um, it's perhaps uh, one of the first tunes I started recording on a computer at home. Um, and uh, it's also a tune that we did with a ver an early in incarnation of Portmanteau. Uh, and that's why some of the musicians on it are, are Portmanteau guys. And uh, big thanks to them for their contribution. It didn't end up on a portmanteau album. Uh, the original version had a few problems with the recording. Uh, and so um, when the Another Story uh, project came together, particularly being Cinematic Sea, Island and all that, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to revisit the tune, clean it up a bit and actually get it out there at last. So I guess bongos is just me imagining, you know, what an islander in the South Pacific might be playing uh, in the back of a, a sort of South Sea sort of tune. I think I might have had some of those old 50s and 60s movies in my mind as well, where people are wearing sort of bright shirts and playing the bongos. Um, and it, it's also a you know fairly low key way to start the tune off and leaves plenty of space for it to build as it goes through and of course that's what the heavier drums later on in the tune are about about lifting it and, and providing some variation which is always something I like to do as for the great soprano sax solo well, that's our good friend Philippe Conus um, I did mention this was originally a portmanteau tune and that's uh, something that survived from the original portmanteau recording and it is indeed an absolutely fantastic solo over um, some you know, reasonably complex chords but um, Philippe's a fantastic jazz player and pulled off without any worries whatsoever. mentioned that I, I don't really sit down to write something of a certain genre. Um, I typically just, you know, mess around on the keyboard and if something sounds promising I try to develop it. And on this particular day I, I think I was uh, messing around with fake guitar sounds and I came up with that, uh, that melody on, that ended up on Burning Inside and, and really it, uh, it went from there. And yeah, the 6-8 the thing and, and the folk thing. Look, it wasn't intentionally a, a throwback to anything, but, uh, you know, I guess it's not a million miles away from a bit of Jethro Tull, that sort of thing. Um, and I guess if we're honest, it perhaps uh, doesn't fit in with the sort of South Seas flavour of the other tunes all that well. But it's uh, another thing that was a bit too epic for Portmanteau and, and uh, in that sense um, we felt it deserved a place on the Cinematic Sea album. Okay, so that this, is, this is all programmed drums of course, the bass is played by me on a keyboard. Uh, there's this Hammond organ and there's sort of uh, a sampled pipe organ. The strings are also from samplers. Um, 
And uh, I guess the weirdest part in that uh, build-up section in the middle is actually the strings. Um, it doesn't really conform to any particular scale that I know of. Um, but in the process, you know, it sounds you know, kind of quite wild and quite interesting. And uh, if I'm honest, it's probably one of those things that came about accidentally. And you listen back to it and you think, mm, wow, OK, that's different enough to keep. So that's where that came from. Um, and only fair to say that the, uh, you know, the build-up wouldn't really work without the, uh, the really good Stratocaster solo from Henry over the top. Well, I wish it was a 12-string guitar. At that time, I didn't own one, but that was the effect I was trying to go for. In fact, it's two different acoustics with different tonal qualities uh, played at the same time. And it does achieve a 12-string effect, but it is not a 12-string guitar. This brief piece, again, is highly influenced by surf music. Um, and I can't quite remember how I arrived at this tune, uh, except indeed it again is highly influenced by the surf music coming out of California in the early 60s. I used a variety of guitars. I guess the go-to guitar was my Fender Stratocaster, which uh, for guitar aficionados is a uh, 1982 reissue of a 1958 um, Fender Stratocaster with the maple neck. And I used slide on that a lot as well. Um, I did use an ES-175 jazz guitar, notably on Count Me Out. And I also used uh, uh, a couple of acoustic uh, guitars, uh, a Martin and also a Taylor, and I also use ukulele. I think I may have used my Les Paul uh, judiciously here and there, uh, and I played percussion on some tunes. Because there's a lot of older tunes, um, it actually features some pretty old keyboards. Um, there's an old uh, Roland XP30 uh, that a number of sounds were drawn from. Um, I'm pretty sure the Hammond organ on um, Sweet Complication is my old Hammond X5, a transistor Hammond, um, or solid state Hammond that I don't have anymore. Um, on some of the other tracks, there's my more recent Hammond XK2 going through, a, I think, a Leslie 860 that I've still got. Um, there's also a fair sprinkling of both uh, melodic and chord and drum sounds from my Yamaha S90 ES keyboard, which is sort of the master keyboard I use in the studio. Um, but also quite a lot of use of uh, synth and sampler instruments um, from uh, uh, the Avid Expand instrument and also a, a program called uh, Reason uh, running within Pro Tools. Um, so a number of sounds drawn from that as well. <laughs> 